plan for today is to finish the requirements and, and specifications and specifically to talk about uh, the uniform modeling language, UML, which is something that is, is very helpful in expressing requirements and specifications. <coughs> so last time, we, uh, we looked at uh, how do you collect and express requirements in the form of user stories and in the form of a strum and or mock-up or wireframe uh, for, the, for the interfaces. And I would like uh, every team to include uh, some user stories and some wireframes <coughs> in their requirements and specification document. But let's move on beyond uh, requirements to, uh, to specifications. Specification and requirements are very similar. In fact, for the purpose of the project, we just have one document uh, for both. If the requirements are more uh, a direct expression of the end user view of your system, then the requirements, if you want, are uh, taking those the specifications are taking the requirements and making them more explicit, more precise, uh, covering all circumstances and all, uh, all possible corner cases of your system. It is the specifications that, it, um, that your programmers will use to actually implement the, the requirements. This is, moving from requirements and to specifications uh, may be hard, uh, depending on how well you understand the domain and therefore the requirements and how difficult uh, is, is your project, but in some way, think about it as the requirements being some uh, a specific, discrete set of points uh, describing the interface between the outside world and your system. In the specification stage, you want to actually make that a continuous, uh, you want to describe all the possible ways in which the system can be used. And these may be uh, even some ways that your customer might not be aware. Okay, so this is, this is not easy in general. Um, and people uh, have tried, and they do actually practice informal specifications. Essentially, you write an English or whatever natural language document in which, in which you're trying to describe precisely and unambiguously what your system does. And that has uh, serious problems in, in general because uh, natural language, it's very easy to uh, miss something and not be uh, obvious that you missed something. Um, there could be ambiguities. Uh, one page, in one page, you are suggesting that something should work in a certain way, and the other page, uh, the language may be ambiguous. Um, and uh, contradictions as well. Uh, even though you're not going to say uh, do A and do uh, not A, or do not do A, explicitly, this could be implicit uh, in, in, in your language. So these are, this could lead to problems. Let me go through an exercise of uh, trying to write a specification for this requirement statement from the customer. So let me read it for you in case uh, it's too small here. If sales for the current month are below the target sales, then a report is to be printed. Unless the difference between target sales and actual sales is less than half the difference between target sales and actual sales in previous month, or if the difference between target sales and actual sales for the current month is under 5%. <coughs> so when we look at this statement, it's clear that um, this tries to describe uh, the conditions under which something needs to happen. The report has to be printed. And the spirit of this statement is that uh, you need the report except if the report would be too similar to last month's report. This is the, the essence. But of course, taking that as a specification is not enough for the programmers to actually implement it. So uh, there's an attempt here to be more precise. What does it mean to be too similar? Okay, It's similar if the difference between target sales and actual sales is about the same as uh, last month or actually smaller than last month. The difference, or if the difference is actually very small, so you don't need the report. <coughs> okay, so this seems like uh, it's a good step towards being precise, so maybe you're ready to actually implement it. But if you don't think about it carefully, there are um, parts of this statement here that are not very clear, and you would probably discover this the moment you try to put this in computer language. 
let me let me highlight some of the things that may be confusing here or ambiguous. So there's a notion of uh, of sales. Okay, if you are not a domain expert in sales, you may not know exactly how to get this value from the rest of your uh, data. Um, so what are the sales? Are there uh, orders received but not yet paid for? Are those considered as uh, sales? Or uh, only once the money is in the bank is considered a sale? Do you happen to know what the answer to this might be in general? So uh, generally, the moment the, uh, when the customer has signed the order, okay, they open the, they open the bottle of champagne, the sales team. Okay, they, they sold it. Now, when the money comes, uh, that's, a, that's a financial, uh, the accounting uh, aspect. Okay, so moving, moving beyond that. So let's say now you understand every uh, notion here, what it means. But putting them together the way this statement tries to is still, it's still tricky. Um, so current month target sales. Okay, this suggests that somewhere in your system you have a record or a way to compute what the target sales are for the month. And probably uh, this, this implies that there are some monthly sales targets. Okay? Again, you have to look at the rest of your specification, see how do I get the monthly targets. Most companies actually work on quarterly uh, targets. So if that's the case, but you want the report to be printed monthly because you want to know if you're falling behind, um, then maybe the month is a third of a quarter, whatever. You have to call the customer, say, what do you mean uh, here? Okay, but now we get into uh, even trickier stuff. Um, if you look at the structure of this long sentence, it says the report has to be printed unless A or if B. Okay, so there's, there's two ways to interpret this. It's uh, unless A or B, or uh, if not A or if B. Okay, so let me, uh, you see, in English, in natural language, it's hard to actually be precise, but the computer wants to be very precise. The computer wants to write, are you talking about if not A or B, unless A or B, or if not A or B? So in some way, how do you parenthesize here, unless A or B, or unless A or B? What do you think the customer meant here? Um, why? Why do you think so? Uh, it seems reasonable if you start to understand the domain and how they think and why they need this software and why they need this report. Probably, uh, probably they mean the first one because they don't want the report if the difference is small and they don't want the report if this other difference is small. So it's really this that you should be implementing. But, the, but there's a comma there. Okay? Does this mean, see, there's another comma here. And if you want to take a computer science interpretation of English saying that the commas are kind of parentheses, okay, so if you, you can take out this part of the comma unless comma and then if, so maybe it's this. Okay? Okay? What I want to show is that especially when you get into if, uh, unless, you'll, uh, you'll discover that people in natural language use these words somewhat more liberally uh, than computers. Okay, uh, let's, let's move along uh, because I think you got the idea. Okay, but there's another one that seems very clear to a salesperson. If the difference between target sales and actual sales for the current month is less than 5%. Uh, oh, this is not so clear to a computer. So you have target sales, actual sales. How do you write this conditional that the customer has in mind? Can you? Like T over A less than 0 0.05. Okay. Like this? T minus 
Okay, okay. But then we'll give you a percent. I write let's write the conditional. Yeah. Is it set? I think it's a difference, so it's for the T minus. So how do you say that this should Is that it? Absolute value. <coughs> Absolute value. Okay. I think this is what they mean indeed, the difference between target sales and absolute value. Okay, so we'll we'll take that liberty to translate in, in math. Um, is this it? Could be over T. Oh, it could be over T. What are, what are them is <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Uh, what if A is zero? How do, you, well, how do you define percent? And the salesperson say, oh, you know what? If it's small, that's what they meant. And they picked five out of, uh, you know, blue. Uh, but even this one, this is actually what I had in mind in terms of ambiguity here. If this is a small uh, difference, it doesn't make much difference if you use T or A. Okay? But if we're talking... It's, a, it's something you have to program. So you have to tell the computer which one it is. And the difference is uh, slight, but there is a difference. And if this percentage is larger, then the difference is actually quite, quite significant, depending on how, how you do it. And honestly, uh, which one do you think they would want? Uh, T minus A over A? Yeah, I would say uh, T minus A over T. Why? Good question. Why? <laughs> uh, it's because, uh, but you see, we're getting down into interpretation. Because this is, the, this is the target. This is your goal. And you want to see if you are within 5% oh, of the goal. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. That makes sense. And this kind of makes sense even if it's 50%. Say, are you 50% above or below the goal, not the actual? And uh, then that kind of answers the question, what if t is zero? Oh, t is never zero in the company. <laughs> um, OK, moving along. Got it? Um, be careful with this. Um, you, you see a complicated statement like this and say, there's a lot of detail here. I can go program it. And it's only when you start writing the code that you realize that, um, no, it's not enough. <coughs> OK, so. Um, Everybody will say, well, informal specifications have uh, these problems and these problems. Uh, you know, all the textbooks will say it, but still, everybody does it. Why do you think they still write specifications in natural language? It's easy. It's easy to what? To write down other than this complicated writing. Yes, OK. Uh, indeed, it's, it's actually uh, easier to write it down, but it's, it's a catch. Okay, it's easy to communicate to the average person. Yeah, right. Exactly. I, I, like, I like the way you put it. Uh, and I, I have a different way of saying it. It's, it. it's common. This is the common language that you can communicate to your customers and your developers. Because uh, customers can read formal specs. Many programmers can't read this. I mean, or have trouble thinking about uh, this. Uh, or managers. So it's kind of we're using the, the weakest language that everybody understands. But we have to just realize what we're missing. Um, there are situations when we use uh, true formal specs. When you write uh, software that's safety critical, you have to actually start writing math. Uh, or if not math, language that has very precise meaning almost like a programming language. So in fact, most of the software that fly airplanes or control uh, medical devices, uh, you before you write the actual software in a programming language, you use something that's called a modeling language, which uh, has very precise meaning. It still uses words, um, perhaps more, more words than a... Um, um, than actual programming language, but has very precise meaning. And some of them actually can be simulated. Uh, so there's this modern language that you can simulate. And then uh, perhaps it doesn't run fast enough, then you program it into a, or you generate code automatically. Um, OK, but that's, that's uh, very hard to understand, very costly. Uh, and it's probably overkill uh, for most projects. 
Again, so in the situations where you probably want to use something like waterfall, as you spend more time in these stages, you probably want to go to a more precise notion of specs. Uh, because your project won't change as, uh, very much. You won't have many iterations, but you want to get it right, even in the first iteration. So uh, people are you know, seeing the problems with informal specs, the difficulties with the formal specs, found something that's in between, uh, something that's sometimes called uh, semi-formal specs. Uh, more precision than a natural language um, in various places, but not quite as hard to read as, uh, as mathematical notation. So typically, this is a visual notation for semi-formal uh, specs. Uh, so typically, it's some sort of boxes and arrows notation. And you have already seen some. You have uh, seen uh, finite automata, tape machines. Those can be used to describe uh, systems. You have used uh, flowcharts, I assume, when you started to learn how to program. Those are all semi-formal specs that you write on your way towards writing the actual code. So what I want to show in the rest of today's lecture is one such language for semi-formal specs that's used quite a bit in industry. And it's called UML, stands for Unified Modeling Language. Well, let's talk. Uh, for one moment, what is modeling as opposed to programming? Uh, modeling is describing the system uh, at uh, a somewhat higher level of uh, abstraction. So essentially, you are describing a model of the system. It's not the actual uh, low-level instructions, but it's a diagram of the system, perhaps, or it's a flowchart or pseudocode. All of those are models of your system. More precise than the natural language, less precise than actually computer code. And uh, so modeling is actually used uh, quite a bit for uh, specification, even for design. And as I said before, if this is a safety critical system, then you probably spend a lot of time uh, doing modeling of the system and simulation and so on. Uh, so I mentioned state machines as kinds of models. Uh, entity relationship diagrams are models that you may have encountered in your database courses. Uh, that's how you describe schemas of databases, flowcharts. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to show here is the uh, UML language, but a bit of history first. In the, in the 80s, as the object-oriented languages were uh, coming along, um, people started to uh, borrow the concepts from object orientation, object-oriented programming into modern language. So they started to create uh, so-called object-oriented uh, modeling languages. Uh, and by early 90s, there were tens of these modeling languages because everybody was creating their, uh, their own. And at some point, three of the leading object-oriented uh, modeling languages were merged. Uh, so essentially, the, the people, uh, the proposers of these uh, three languages, uh, Grady Book, uh, Jim Rombach and uh, Ivan Jacobson. Each one had their own language, but they each realized that you can't have this much fragmentation. Just like for programming languages, uh, these modeling languages are useful for communication. So the more people speak the language, the more useful, the more worthwhile it is to actually use the language. And this is especially even more true for, um, for modeling languages than programming languages. Because for programming languages, uh, you can actually write a compiler to translate the language to the various machines, and then many people can, can run it. Um, if you write the model in a language that nobody understands, and the audience for the model is humans, uh, then you, are, you haven't gotten anywhere. So they got together, they formed a committee, and they started to say, okay, what is common in all of these languages? What's the most useful thing? And in some in some things, uh, they agreed immediately. They all agreed that we have to have this concept. They just had to decide on a common notation. But then, on other things, uh, their opinions started to diverge. And uh, because of this, uh, UML has, a, has an interesting structure whereby uh, there's a core that's practically universally used and understood, but there's many uh, kind of corners of the language that are somewhat obscure, somewhat special, uh, special use. Um, so 
essentially because there was many people trying to put their favorite feature in you have this uh, a little bit of a disjointness in the in the language so that's that's unfortunate and this is typical of uh, languages designed by committees as opposed to languages designed by one person who has one vision um, and uh, they just put it in whether you like it or not that's how they wanted it that tends to be uh, to have more of a um, uniform feeling than languages designed by committee. So, example, do you know languages designed by committee, popular languages that have been designed by committee? Well, internet protocols. Internet protocols, that's fair, yes. Uh, in terms of programming languages, computer programming languages. Ada. Ada, yes. Not many of you have used Ada, but yes, that was a language designed by committee from the beginning. But there's one that's a lot more commonly used. C++. Okay, so uh, there's, a, there's a common joke about UML to uh, speak to this disjointness of its features that uh, it can also stand for union of all modern languages. What we're going to do today is uh, we're going to look at the subset of UML. Actually, uh, it's a very, very small subset, but it's a subset that I actually see being used. Um, and I'm going to show uh, three kinds of diagrams uh, from UML. The first two are used uh, for structural static models. They describe the structure of your, uh, of your subsystems or classes and how they relate without telling you exactly how they interact. What is the sequence of steps they go to in their interaction? Um, for that, for the dynamic part, I'm going to show you uh, sequence diagrams. UML has many more static diagrams and many more dynamic diagrams, uh, the full UML. I'm not going to cover them all, because I think this is the most used subset. If you know this, you'll, you may join a team that uses a couple more. You'll learn the, those two, but these ones you have to understand. Okay, so I will, uh, I will show UML in the context of a very simple example. It's a, it's a little bit boring, but it's simple enough that allows us to kind of show the diagrams we need. So imagine that we're going to try to specify the, the design of a software that manages projects, activities, and tasks. So um, uh, projects, for example, the, your, your group project, may involve a set of activities, which may be done in sequence or, to get, or, or in parallel. For example, choosing the platform, uh, requirements, iteration one, and so on. And then each activity uh, involves several tasks. Uh, write, write the document, uh, design the API, test, uh, write code, so on. And tasks are allocated to resources. OK, so this is uh, what we're going to be using for, uh, for our example. Well, so let's start. The first uh, UNL diagram, the class diagrams, uh, these are used to describe uh, the entities that take part in, in your system. But you can also think of them as the classes if you were to program in an object-oriented language. However, I want to point out UML borrows a lot of terminology from object orientation, but it's applicable even if you don't use an object-oriented programming language. Because okay? you still have objects that interact in your system, but you could be using um, a language that doesn't have object orientation. It'd be okay. Okay, so it's important to realize that class diagrams, and in fact, for the, uh, for the first part of the lecture, we're, we're only showing the, the objects that exist and how they interact, not so much, uh, and, and how they relate to each other, not so much uh, the sequence of steps uh, to which they interact. Okay, uh, a class diagram, it's, it's a box with a name, and then perhaps a set of public fields in this case, it's an, a project has a name, which is a string, and has a start date, which is a date, and then uh, a number of public public methods. So in some way, uh, this bottom part of the class uh, box describes the interface of that box. Uh, early on in your project, when you're doing a specification, perhaps you don't know exactly what fields you need uh, or what methods you need. So you may even leave this empty. And there's still, uh, you just have a box with the name. That's perfectly fine for the initial stages of your project. 
And the more detail you put in, the more it becomes a design. To the point where you get to your design stage, which is the second big document you're going to be writing, where you want to actually list the APIs uh, for these classes. Okay, so boxes. Uh, and then we have arrows. And that's pretty much it for the, for the static diagrams. Uh, we have several kinds of uh, connectors between these boxes. Uh, the first one I want to describe, it's, it's the aggregation uh, link or connector. And this connects two of these uh, classes and describes a contains relationship or an includes or belongs relationship, okay? Uh, it's not just an arbitrary relationship. Essentially, this is saying that the project includes activities. So I'm connecting the project uh, box with the activity box with this edge. Notice this filled-in diamond uh, on the side of the hole, the containing side. So the project contains activity. Uh, so why do we say that the project contains activity? Because the activities do not exist outside of the project in our system. That's an important relationship. So this also means that every activity belongs to one project. It cannot be contained into a different project. It cannot belong to a different project. So um, we can describe how many activities are in a project with this. These are called arities. These are little labels that are put at the at this uh, ends of the connector. So this one, on the project side, it means that uh, an activity has one project, if you read it from activity to project. The, the other one, one to many, from, no, from one to essentially uh, infinity, a project can contain at least one activity, one or more activities, okay? So it's, it's fairly, fairly simple. There any any questions? Okay, connectors, diamond on the hole, and uh, arities. Sometimes you don't put the arity here next to the diamond because it's always one. <coughs> if it's a diamond, uh, if if activity is included in a project, there's only one project that it can be included on. Okay. Um, so this particular uh, relationship aggregation uh, is important for, uh, for understanding how to initialize these objects, um, how to find them. So typically to find activities, you come through projects because projects uh, have activities. And you know that each activity has one project. So uh, the project perhaps should be responsible for initializing, for cleaning up. Uh, the activity, and if you uh, if you program in a language with memory management like C or C++, it's most likely that the project is responsible for allocating and deallocating uh, the memory. But if the activity has some other resources, then perhaps the project should take care of initialization and cleanup. Okay, moving along, uh, generalizing the uh, these links between classes, uh, so there are general associations or relationships. Without trying to specify that you belong to somebody, you just relate uh, to somebody. For example, uh, tasks and resources. Well, resources, I give you the example. These are the, the uh, members of your team. So resources can do tasks. It's not right to say that the resource belongs to a task. Not even that the task belongs to a resource. Okay? The task perhaps belongs to the activity, but it's related to the resource. Uh, but, uh, and maybe you have a label here that says the task is assigned to the resource. Let's look at the labels. One or more. So a task is assigned to one or more resources. There may be tasks that require more than one resource. That's essentially what this is saying. Uh, a resource is assigned to zero or more tasks. So star, like in regular expressions, uh, means zero or more. Because there might be some resources not associated with tasks. Uh, so these edges sometimes are labeled um, just to understand what kind of relationship. There might be <coughs> more relationships between a resource and a task. And these are typically this, uh, implemented with some pointers in there. So for this one, how do you implement this, uh, this link, this association? 
So tasks are assigned to resources. I have a sense you don't, you don't understand the question. Um, so imagine that you will implement these two classes. Okay? Uh, so each of these boxes gets implemented as a class in your object-oriented language. How is this link going to be represented in your program, in your data structure? Right, so a task will probably have some array or list of resources. It can't just be one, because you see it can be one or many. And it looks like there's an invariant that that list is going to be non-empty. Okay? You may also have, in the resource, uh, you may have a, a list of the tasks it's uh, assigned to. Okay. Or, if you were in a database, uh, if you learn about database schemas and normalizing schemas, there might be a separate data structure that's called task assignment, which lists task resource, task resource, all of the all of the mapping between tasks and resources. That's how you represent this in a database. Okay. Let's uh, uh, let's practice a little bit this notation. How uh, would you draw the class diagram for a singly linked list. Okay, I'll start, because uh, I'll start with the easy part. There's a box. <coughs> and this is the list entry. Okay, what do you typically have in a list entry? Um, well, let's not talk about variables. Let's talk about what, what fields you have. A value. You have a value. Okay, uh, some value. Pointer to next. Uh, a pointer to the next. Okay, so how do we represent this in, in UML class diagrams? Is it a uh, contains relation? Is it an aggregation relationship or, or just a, an association? If you don't know, you start with an association because that's the more general one. You are not committing to a relationship. So, what is the list entry associated with? It's another list entry. Okay, so uh, it's perfectly fine to have such loops if you want. Uh, furthermore, if you want to be more precise, you're going to say uh, for every uh, so I'm going to put, uh, let's say, an arrow, just to make it a little bit less ambiguous. And let's call this next. This is the next association. If you write, let, let, how would you write the arities on the next? For one list entry, how many next entries you have? One. Always one? Or zero. Okay. And for one entry, how many parents it has? So what do you write here? One or zero. Okay, let's let's write it let's start like this. Okay, so if you write something like this, then uh, this is probably um, it's a little bit restrictive because it prevents you from having lists that join. But maybe, maybe that's actually what you want. Okay, this is not this this structure, data structure, is not represented by this UML diagram because this has two parents. Okay, so this is not allowed by your diagram. So you see, by playing with this uh, relationships and with the arities, you can. Uh, you can specify important invariants about your data structure. Okay, so maybe this should be zero uh, or more, or, or simply star. This would allow. If you write one, always there for next, as some 
uh, of you suggested, then that describes a very special kind of list. Circular list. <coughs> it's the only kind of list that you are guaranteed that the next pointer is not known. The list never ends. Okay? Um, what about binary trees? Uh, tree no. There's a value and then there's a there's a left and there's a right. There's two associations. You may want to draw two edges and then pretty much the same. Okay? So these are just some very degenerate diagrams if you want with only one node, but I think it's 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 good practice. Um, for the list node, I'm just a little confused as to why you don't also write like the next pointer as a variable in the class. You got something the class holds? Like below value? You you can. Oh, you, you can. can. Okay. Uh, you can. You can do that, but uh, th there's two orthogonal aspects of, uh, of a class diagram. One is, what is the uh, contents of one class? Okay, you list here all the fields, all the, all the methods. But the other that's more interesting for this discussion is, what is the relationship between classes? Okay, and that you describe with this kind of special uh, links and uh, special arities. Okay, that's what I really wanted to do. Uh, let's um, let's stop here. Let's take a break, okay? And we'll continue. Uh, we'll continue in a bit. I have a puzzle for you again. One about Joe and Einstein.
it's kind of annoying. Yeah, so it's, okay. it's only I used to be a golfer. Yeah. So I did I don't know what it is. I have like some weird thing here. I've tried installing VM twice and both times I'm just like VM there. Um, I don't know. I tried to, I did it a while ago. I tried to, I tried like virtual blocks and then some other tool that my friend told me and both times I'm just like, I could, they like made everything blue screen both times. So I don't even want to try it. Yeah, I don't try to be on where it works. Okay. Do you think it could also put like this buddy in to a, a Unix terminal and test it there? Or is that bad? Yeah. Yeah. So, one, one so I can do that. One thing we should do is that you know. So just move like my whole Jingo one time. No, no, you only need to move, you only need to run it for. No, not really. Only the testing script. Yeah. Um, Jingo is deploying the right. Yeah. I mean, <coughs> uh, if I haven't deployed to Heroku, <coughs> I can like test it locally. I'm trying to deploy to Heroku first and then. Yeah, I just want to ask that the juvenile refactory of our the entire game, right in the front end, we need the view had the front of the juvenile and one of the front of the view, but in the back end, there's no Because in the front end, the model. From, um, from the back end, it's Ajax, and it needs to cover this update. Right. So in the back end, there's no such thing. In the back end, the model is all synchronous. So you call the model, and it looks like that. The model does not need to know what it is right now. That's not right. 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 The only way things change is if you tell the model. So it's like, it's like uh, one direction. It's not, no, it's, it's, it's a sync. That's the word. It's not. The view calls the model, the model does all of its work, and comes back with it. That's it. The model then doesn't do it. The JavaScript is tell the model to do something, you actually reverse, and then the, the work finishes later. And the model has to have a way to do it. Okay, so let's see. Uh, questions, issues about the project, or Maybe the one part here I don't have issues with the project. Yes, Let's see a quick clarification. We so since this free UI integration is optional, if you can see we can make like the REST API calls, or we can make the URL request uh, to our code to put on Heroku or the book like the text and JSON mm -hmm. with the correct information, that's all we do. Yes. Did you understand? Did, do I have to repeat that? So the uh, we made the UI integration uh, optional. That's what task four. Uh, the only way we're going to test your system is to send a request to Heroku and check the responses, the JSON responses. Okay. Um, do we get extra credit if we did do UI integration? Um, I can shake your hand. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to uh, to change the grading structure so late. Uh, dropping requirements feels like. It's Okay, more okay than adding ways to make points so late. Okay, all right. So, but you've done it uh, and you learned something. Else. Okay, so uh, I'm 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 following the traffic on Piazza. Um, there's a lot of issues that people are having, and well, welcome to uh, programming in a bigger scale. This is how uh, life is. Especially when you use uh, things like Heroku and Rails that try to do a lot of magic behind the, uh, under the hood. And if that magic goes a little bit off, uh, it, it's kind of frustrating. And personally, I mean, I absolutely dislike Rails for this reason. Uh, because it tries to do too much, I think it's fine as a toy, but the moment you start to do serious things, uh, um, I feel like it gets more in the way. Heroku a little bit the same, but for Heroku at least there's no other option to get free servers out there, uh, so you pay the price for that. <coughs> the other thing that kind of worries me 
um, is how late you guys started. Um, and let me say it again. This is a lesson that I should have learned in all my years of teaching. Um, when I designed the project, I gave you two weeks because it was a lot of work, not because it meant you can wait for a week before you start. Okay? So don't make this mistake of saying that everything can be done in the last two days, no matter how long the deadline is. Um, I just wanted to make like one comment. I started last week, but I got like literally nowhere until a discussion last Tuesday when like all of a sudden things made more sense. So I think like having that discussion earlier is what it helped. Okay, so discussion earlier would have helped. Um <coughs> Because no. I, I started like last week very early and I just with, with what? With, uh, with the Django, like everything. Okay, so with the Django, we did it in class. Yeah. So the the back end uh, that I read, uh, so if you read my notes for Django, you should have been able to actually start the Django project. If, we, we did it for the game, uh, treasure game controller, yeah. okay? And it's 10 lines plus a lot of Django commands to kind of set things up. And I actually, I gave you the code for that. I, I walked briefly through the code. Um, the other thing I need to say is that I was teaching this class a few years ago with no discussions. Because I truly believe you need to get away from the notion of discussions. In a semester or two, there will be no more discussion sections. Okay? And you'll be asked to go pick up Rails in a week, install this, go get started. Um, so you have to you have to get used to searching, uh, to reading the information, to reading the instructions. Many people have trouble on the outside; they are not reading the instructions. Um, okay. Other questions? Did you get a chance to think about this one? Comments, solutions, attempt. I enjoy even comments. I, I'm not necessarily looking for the solution. I can see in the back over there. Um, I was thinking they could be, there's like a bunch of different numbers that they could be. So I don't know how the, the only thing that the red hair comment helps you with is that there is an oldest son. That doesn't help me with the fact that the younger sons could be like the same age or different ages. Uh, did, you're, you're glancing at your uh, laptop here. Did you write down the combinations? Yeah. Okay, that's a that's a good good first step. Um, you're very close. You're very close. In fact, you almost have the solution. Uh, um, so, uh, I guess this is an observation. But uh, I would object to the word prime. Oh, we can have one also. Or four. Yeah. So take out the prime. So yes, uh, I should have said the ages are integers. That when they multiply, get 36. Yeah, so it's not a large number of combinations to make 36 out of three numbers. But you are on the right path. Well, your two choices are you have three, four, and three, or one, Three and thirteen. One, three, and uh, you probably mean twelve here. Yeah. Oh, sorry, twelve. Yeah. And then you said three, four. Four, four and three. Uh, wh why? Why did you? Why only these two choices? Because there's three sons. Um, those are the only three numbers that multiply up to twelve. Or, to one, one, thirty-six. Oh, well. One, four, nine. Well, okay. One, that, there's more. Okay. There's more. Um, All right. Okay. But. Okay, now I'm <coughs> I guess I'll, yeah. So after I I just read out all the combinations, I add them together. I think they're like all of them have different number two for the for the apples. Why do you want to Okay, good. <laughs> good. So what he did he, he actually listed systematically all combinations. Actually I think out the word systematically. He listed what he thinks are all the combinations. And then uh, he add them all up, which Einstein would be doing. 
And uh, Einstein knows the number of apples on the table. You don't, but Einstein knows. So, uh, so Einstein would be able to pick up with a combination that with some matches the number of apples on the table. And his observation is that all of them have different numbers, so clearly Einstein should have figured it out here. Why did Einstein need more information? He might not be able to tell which one is which age. And so that gave him information to assign ages. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of truth to what you say, but maybe I'm not allowed to add an observation. Try it out. Okay. I, I think it's cute how there seems to be not enough information here, and then you can figure out everything. I like these kinds of um, problems. But let's move on to our um, boxes and arrows. Huh? So you're not going to tell us the answer? <laughs> no, but what I can do is I can post it on Piazza so you can have the data. No, you can figure out the answer. What will, will be the value if I tell you... <laughs> Three, four, three, and uh, no, no. Uh, I think these are more interesting when you suffer a little bit. Just like Heroku. Heroku is a big satisfaction <laughs> once you figure out yourself. <laughs> okay. Um. And again, it's not about the answer. It's about the journey there. Yeah, so I don't want to spoil it. It's what? <laughs> exactly. It, I I won't be using the results of your project. The the and the long term result from this project will be what you learn doing it. It's not the actual thing. Okay. Um, so boxes and arrows uh, for describing class diagrams. Uh, it's actually fairly easy stuff if you remember just a few conventions. And I told you UML is a lot bigger than this. Well, they have more kinds of arrows with all sorts of kind of signs at the end for being more and more precise about how these relationships work. Okay, if you need those, if you encounter those, you look them up, but you should know a lot, at least this much. Um, so let me show you some examples, um, not with uh, single link lists and binary trees, but uh, back to our project activities and tasks. So <coughs> we have projects that contain, okay, I'm going to be highlighting with that uh, the element, contain one or more activities. Uh, and each activity is contained in one project, each project one or more. Same story between activities and tasks. So you have here a hierarchy of project activities and tasks. Tasks are assigned to resources. And uh, in this diagram here, it looks like each task is assigned to one resource precisely. Uh, but resources may be assigned more tasks, zero more tasks. Okay. Notice that I did not, even though um, a task is assigned to a, a, exactly one resource, I'm not saying that the task is containing resource, it belongs to resource, because that's trying to add more, more semantics than I want to hear. It's just simply um, associated with one resource. Any, any questions? No? Okay. Um, so, same diagram with just more detail filled into the boxes, but the same kind of structure of the boxes. What I wanted to show here is that when you move from specification to design, or when you refine a design from high level to class level design, typically you do this, you fill in the APIs, okay? So the project has a, a name and a start date, uh, the activity, an ID, a start date, hours, and what you need to deliver, okay? And one thing I want to point out is that the moment you start to design the actual classes as opposed to just the relationship between them, you may realize that there's a lot of similarity between these classes. And the way I wrote the activity and task was on purpose to uh, kind of make them look uh, very similar, but not identical, okay? What kind of mechanisms do you know in designing and writing programs and ob object-oriented programs uh, where you can somehow mm -hmm. share the commonality between classes. Inheritance. Inheritance, okay? So that's where I'm going. Uh, because that's another kind of arrow that I'm going to have between these boxes. Um, and the inheritance uh, is this arrow with an empty uh, triangle. 
So as opposed to the filled in diamond, empty triangle. And what I did, I took the activity and the class, I hoisted out the com common part into something that I'm going to call a work effort, and I make that the superclass of the activity and the task. And then I keep in the activity just what is distinct about the activity uh, compared to the work effort, task compared to the work effort. Okay? So I assume you've done plenty of this in your other programming. Uh, but the point here is UML can describe inheritance uh, relationship. Uh, and UML can also describe interfaces and uh, implement um, the relation between a class and an interface. The other thing I want to point out, uh, there are many errors in, in, in full UML, but they all kind of follow one pattern. Uh, typically, the end of the arrow that has the symbol, the, di the diamond or the triangle, it's the bigger class, the containing class, or the super class, okay? So that's, that's a common uh, mental mnemonic that you can use. Um, okay, moving along. What I, so that's pretty much it, uh, or what I wanted to show about class diagrams. And again, there are, there are variations, and then there are some fine points, uh, additional kind of errors that I don't think it's <coughs> that important to cover. What I want to show is uh, something that I found to be extremely useful. So I've been using UML uh, for many years, and it's always a pain because uh, I have to pull up this graphic uh, tool to draw boxes, save images, uh, and um, the images are kind of hard to put in version control because there's all bits there. So I've discovered uh, recently this tool called Plant uh, UML, which I want you all to, uh, to use. And uh, it's a free tool. It's actually very small. It uh, doesn't support all of UML, but definitely plenty of UML. More than I'm teaching you, uh, more than I actually found use for myself. It's, it's doable. The good thing about it is that you write the UML diagrams in source code. You describe the diagram in text. And that's the text that I save. I put in version control. And then I have tools that automatically uh, create the image and put it on the web somewhere. So if I edit my program to change uh, the textual description of the diagram, automatically uh, an image gets, uh, gets created. Okay? And the source of plant UML, it's a mini language. It's a very small language. It's easy to read. Actually, there's value even in reading the English version uh, of it. So uh, let me show some of the diagrams that we've seen. Uh, these are actually generated with plant uh, UML. This is the source for this diagram. Uh, okay, there's a start UML and end UML markers, uh, which uh, actually you don't need these markers if, um, well, let me, you, you don't always need these markers. This is the essence of the diagram. Uh, so there's a project uh, connected to an activity. This is uh, um, the way you describe the arrow. Star means the filled in diamond. Um, so horizontal, arrow, uh, star, and these are the labels that you put on the arrow. Okay, these are optional. Uh, then activity to task, this edge. Then the task to uh, the task to resource, this edge. And then colon, this is a label for the edge, assigned to, and this uh, arrow results in this arrow. Okay, so it's pretty cool. I mean, this is all. And notice that uh, plant UML will go and collect all of the entities that are involved in these relationships. Uh, and it figures out that even though there are only three edges, there's four uh, actors involved, so it draws the boxes. The other thing it does, uh, it will lay it out nicely for you. Figure out how to position them such that the arrows don't intersect and all that. So, um, okay. Um, so let me, um, let me move on and show you another kind of diagram, uh, which is uh, it's a very related to the class diagram. It's called the object diagram. And it represents also the static structure of a system, but it's not in terms of classes. It's in terms of objects, instantiation of classes. And you will recognize the object diagrams is what you've been drawing on, on paper when thinking about data structures, okay? different list cells. Um, so this is kind of small to read, but uh, 
what it is, it's a set of objects at a particular point in time when using our project activity task diagram. Each box, it's an object. Okay, this is different from the class diagram, where each box stands for the class, that is, all of the possible objects of that class. So here, each one is an instance, and because of this, it has concrete fields, like name, human resource system development, start date, January 5th, 1998. And uh, so this is, a, this is a project, and you can see that it has one, two, three activities. These are the activities. Each activity has tasks. One, two tasks belong to the first activity. One, two to the second activity. Three tasks for the third activity. So this is essentially a blow up of your class diagram instantiating the objects and showing how the objects exist. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, an object diagram for a linked list would be exactly what you've been doing, uh, something like this. This is a list with three elements. Okay, this is an object diagram. A class diagram has one box per class, and then the edges like that. Okay, uh, we normally use class diagrams because that's that's the essence. But sometimes when you want to give a concrete, uh, you know, use um, of the class diagram, we make an object diagram. Uh, so the class diagrams sometimes the arrow. Uh, uh, arrows are a little bit confusing because it looks like there's a looping structure here, but it's a looping only at the level of the class. If you were to blow up this into individual objects, there's no loop in the actual data structure. Okay? So that's, that's really how the object diagrams can help sometimes because it, it makes it all more, more concrete. Okay, so um, let me see. Um, I... Uh, I want to take so I'm, I want to now uh, the, the slides are moving to the next part of UML, but I want to take a few minutes to do a little exercise with just the class diagrams and the object diagrams uh, so far. So we're going to do a, a, a little design here, or uh, and it's a design of a set of classes that are used for doing uh, uh, input output. And it's similar to the way Java input output works. So I'm going to describe it first in English, what I want, what functionality I want to achieve. And then we're going to try to, dis to write the class structure for it. So let's say that we have the, uh, a writer. And this is going to be a class that uh, has a write method, maybe taking a string. And there's going to be many kinds of writers in our system, write to the console, write to a file, write to the network, and we can call this write function to just send strings <coughs> to the writer, okay? But I want to have multiple kinds of features for these writers. For example, I want to have a buffered writer, which is like a writer. It has a write string a write method, but when I write to the buffer writer, it doesn't, um, it, it buffers the strings until it accumulates a certain amount, and then it sends it to the file or sends it to the network or whatever. So this can improve uh, performance. I also want to have a uh, um, filter writer that also have has the right method, but it also uh, contains a regular expression and will remove from the strings you are writing everything that matches the expression. Let's say, okay? And one more thing, uh, a counting writer. This one is also a writer, but it also maintains uh, some statistics about how much you've been writing. OK, so now the thing is, I want, with these classes, to be able to construct functionality as, uh, let's have a buffered writer with counting. Let's have uh, a buffer writer with filter and counting before the filtering, or uh, counting after the filtering. I want to be able to construct all of these combinations. 
So one way uh, to do that is to take each of these combinations and, and give, construct a class for it, like buffer filter counting, as opposed to buffer counting filter writer, or only buffer filter writer. But that's actually too much, uh, too many classes to write. So I, I would like to construct classes that have, with just these four classes, be able to construct all that uh, combinations. OK, so how, how would you, OK, I'll start with the writer. And then I'll, I'll want your help. Um, we have the writer, and it has the right method. Okay. What do I do? Uh, how do I build the the buffered writer? <coughs> well, I, I mean, it's going to be a, a yeah. You block, and then you use the writer as a resource. So you're saying that the buffer writer uses a writer to do the actual writing. So uh, I'm going to, what kind of relationship is this? What kind of relationship is it? So, but before we go to inheritance, we're saying that a buffer writer has a writer. But you write to buffer writer, it does the buffering, and then it forwards everything to an actual writer. Okay, so the buffer writer contains a writer. So each buffer writer contains one writer, and the writer, uh, sorry. I, I put the wrong. I'm, I'm getting confused now. Uh, so the buffer writer contains a writer. So we put the diamond on the containing part, and uh, it contains only one writer. Um, okay, but. Something is missing. I want the buffer writer to be used wherever a writer is used. Because if you write a piece of code that needs a writer to write stuff, I want to give it a writer that's a buffer writer, or a counting writer, or a filter writer. So what do I need to be able to write that kind of code? I want the buffer writer to, so a buffer writer contains a writer. A buffer writer is a writer as well, because if I write code that needs a writer, I could give it a buffer writer, and the code should not care that I'm buffering. So how do I express this? Is a relationship. What is is a? Okay, this is contains. How do we write an is a relationship? A super class. Super class. Okay, so we have to write a class buffer writer that is a is a subclass of writer, which means you can use a buffer writer wherever a writer can be used. But the implementation of a buffer writer, it only does the buffering part. The actual writing it uses it contains a writer to do the. Okay, and then uh, what about the filtered writer? Well, the same thing. The filter writer has the code to do the filtering. And then, once it's done the filtering, if the string does not contain the filter thing, it, contain, it passes it to a writer. But it's also a uh, subclass. And same for counting. And imagine a splitting writer. A writer that, when you write to it, it will forward the stuff to several places. Okay. A splitting writer <coughs> is is a writer, and it contains also n writers. Okay, so this is how the Java I/O uh, is is designed, and it has the nice feature that because all of these things are writers, you can construct a buffer writer that contains a filter writer 
that contains a counting writer, um, and it all belongs, behaves like a writer. You can use it with a writer, uh, whatever a writer is used. Any questions? Okay. Um, let's move on. Let's move on and talk about the sequence diagrams. So sequence diagrams are about the dynamics of the system. Those diagrams, class diagrams, are about the, the way the system is put together, but not how it operates. Sometimes it's not clear from the class diagram how things move, how things uh, interact. So there's a bunch of diagrams and notations uh, for describing the dynamics of a system. And you have seen, I assume, flowcharts before. You have seen finite state machines. Those are diagrams, dynamic diagrams. UML sequence diagrams is UML's uh, uh, answer to that. This is an example of a diagram. And all of these diagrams have uh, a bunch of actors, which are typically some of your classes, but sometimes the actual users that use your system. And you see labels. This is the project manager. This is a project and activity and task. And uh, there are these kind of, so time. What's important here is that time flows vertically on the, on the diagram. Okay, So things happen over time. And these are the different entities that interact. And the arrows is how they send messages to each other. So here, the, the user interface sends to the project find project by name, OK? And then find activity by project, and then find task by activity. This is a message from the user interface to the task uh, class. And then removing tasks, removing activities, removing projects. So this is the sequence of steps for deleting a project. And it shows that first you find all of the activities of that project, all of the tasks, of all of those activities, you remove all the tasks, you remove the activities, then you can remove the project. <coughs> this may be implicit in the diagram that shows that the tasks belong to activity, which belong to project. Therefore, to delete the project, you have to delete the entire dependency uh, chain. But this is a very explicit way to describe how that goes on over time. OK, so we have the actors. We have these uh, method invocations. And uh, we have these uh, lifespans. So notice this kind of vertical box. This tells you that one invocation of remove project, this is how long it takes. And this is what it does. So all of these, uh, this is a lifetime of one invocation. And notice that it subsumes the lifetimes of the methods it calls. And this is typical of synchronous uh, programming. We make a method call. This is activated. And it ends here, it returns, and then you do more, and it returns. OK? And sometimes you have these lifelines uh, just to keep these activities uh, lined up and, and connected. Uh, so let me, let me show you uh, a plant UML version of this diagram. So this is the same concept from the previous diagram. A user has projects and, uh, and activities. I should have uh, actually I missed I missed a task. Uh, so the user calls remove on a project. This calls find tasks. I say it on activity. There should be task here, and then there's a loop for all tasks. Remove task. So this is how you describe in UML sequence diagrams. What is the, the loop again? Uh, the loop is just it's an auxiliary notation in the sequence diagram that say that this box is repeated as many times. As, as needed, right? So UML sequence diagrams, if you go to the uh, plant UML page, it will show you various things that you can do. Um, sometimes you have exceptional cases put in boxes like this. But in this case, it's just a. So the plant UML exists for a higher level, I guess, in terms of like you go up more outside of like the, you include more, uh, more actors, or like things that are not necessarily <coughs> properly, but like, so that like, the project and the actors that are interacting with the project from the outside? Um, Plant UML is simply a tool to draw this diagram. Okay. Okay. So first you have to think of what diagram you want, and then you have to think about the, how projects interact. Plant UML is simply a language for uh, you write this stuff, and notice that the you know, project goes to activity, uh, find task, this is this arrow. Then I say activate activity. This creates this box. 
up to deactivate activity. So you just write the sequence of steps. Are we going to use this uh, the UML and implement UML later on in the semester, like as part of our project? Well, uh, I recommend that you use it. You will have to use it for the quiz three, because I want you to learn it. It's really, uh, really very useful. Okay. Um, so and this is I have, here. I have another diagram that explains the uh, the AJAX request. Um, the asynchronous AJAX request. Okay, so let me uh, let me just uh, fast forward a little bit because um, I want to conclude the lecture. I want to give you a few minutes to uh, to fill in the the feedback. Okay, so UML it's a, it's a visual language, and being visual, it can be used very well because a good diagram uh, has a lot of detail in an easy to comprehend way. Uh, however. Uh, huge diagrams with many, many, many boxes <coughs> become just as hard to read as a, as a huge document. So use it, uh, use it uh, carefully. Okay. What's bad about UML? Uh, the whole language uh, it's actually very big. It has a lot of stuff that's obscure, very rarely used. Uh, so your team should pick and use a small subset. And I recommend, uh, you know, class diagrams for static structures, sequence diagrams for how things interact. You don't have to have a sequence diagram for every single interaction in your system. The ones that are actually a little bit trickier, uh, more complex, that's where it's worthwhile. And then use tools like PlantUML uh, to actually draw these diagrams because it makes it easy. Okay, so at this point, I'll stop. Uh, please go to the class webpage, click on that lecture feedback link, and uh, submit your feedback now.